All right. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Today we're going to keep going with fish and shellfish. Um, I was going to go into turtles today, but I thought uh, oysters would be more appropriate with uh, Thanksgiving coming up because oyster dressing is one of one of the classics for the East Coast with uh, Thanksgiving, especially since Thanksgiving originally started on the coast area, I believe. And I imagine they had oysters. Okay, um, so I'm going to share a screen with you guys. And just per usual, what we're going to do is I put together this PowerPoint just about oysters with um, harvesting, pre uh, prepping, and cooking and the ways to serve it. So let's get going with it. All right. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the first picture is just how you can, you know, just a couple ideas on how you can get these things. Um, this is a picture of a restaurant platter. This is their sampler. Um, different types of oysters and all these different oysters. There's a video I'm going to put in here about where they come from, you know, like why they look different shapes, sizes, colors, flavors, everything. And it's, that it all has to do with the type of oyster one. And then basically where it's grown, you know, because these things are filter feeders. So if you put oysters in a lake, they're going to be kind of nasty because lake water is stagnant and it doesn't move. Um, if you put some in the ocean, that's good, but there's a lot of heavy currents. Um, and you don't want them where they're completely dry all the time. It's not bad. But um, anyway, so a lot of times these are in rivers um, and they're kind of where the tide goes out. They're not like very far up, but they're far up enough where they do get some sun. Um, but it has to be like a constant moving water. Okay. That's the main thing is these need to be in moving water um, just so that they get fresh water to filter and they actually clean the water while they're filtering. So, and then this is a, uh, here's just two pictures of oysters on the half shell that are eaten raw, a couple dipping sauces. And then this picture is at a, a fish monger, basically a, a fish market. Um, and it has every type of oyster and their price. So just want to kind of show you guys that. It's hard to find a place around here that does that. So this is one is how they harvest them. This is a really good uh, video on how this whole process is done. It's, it's a work ethic. And oysters are some of the hardest work in the world. And it's, it's a hard work, but it's honest. The steps we go through to create an oyster environment, to make that environment grow, to get that environment to the process and to get it to the consumers is pretty dynamic. Basically, uh, it starts off with me, or my dad, or my uncle. If you want to start originally, go to the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, apply for an oyster lease and application form. Get that application granted, given to you as a lease. Then you go out and you assess what needs to be done. Most instances, you have to do something to that water bottom to create habitat for oysters. And that comes where we'll either buy shells, oyster shells back, limestone, crushed concrete, any, any kind of hard substrate to create that water bottom and make it more conducive to oyster production. Then if we don't get a natural spat, a spawn, we call it spat, we'll hopefully rely on the public grounds to have some seed oyster to place on there. Between those processes, it, the ideal scenario would be three years from the time you got a lease to the time you harvest your first oyster would be wonderful. You know, in the ideal world, that's what you're looking for. Typically, two dredges on the boat, throw those dredges over and drag on the bottom and those, those dredges rake the bottom and pick up the oysters. Your crew will pick out the market oysters and, and push over the, the undersized oysters in the shells. Usually you've got one or two men on a table with you and you need gloves, protect your hand, you need a hatchet, a small hatchet at that. And I'm gonna separate, knock off the little baby oysters, I'm gonna knock off the shells, I'm gonna knock off the other foreign items like mussels that I, I can't market. And I'm gonna throw that back in the water. So my way of thinking was, that's an investment, and I don't care what business you're in, you developing future inventory has a cost and it's, it's an investment. And until recently, not many people wanted to give recognition to that, but because of the work of the Oyster Task Force, little things like that are becoming known to people. You have to look at your market conditions, you have to go see your dealers, 
get orders, and once you, you receive your orders, there's so many sacks, you go out and catch them and you meet them at a dock and they load the oysters on their trucks. And if it's a good, high quality product that that, that particular dealer can use, he'll reorder and you'll keep working that way. Then you have a whole nother operation that takes this product in and, and then they, they wash it, they grade it, they, they either shuck it or they pack it into a half shell pack and then it goes out into the broader distribution market. What's amazing is that one oyster is going to touch the human hands as much as five to seven times before it reaches the consumer. My family in a, in a normal year will employ as much as 35 to 50 harvest families. Not to mention the docks, you know, three or four docks that have people working at the dock, the truck drivers who haul the oysters, the processing plants who have a lot of labor, you know, 30, 40 people at least working in their processing plants. Then it goes to the distributors who haul them to the restaurants and supermarkets. So the amount of people that benefit off of what one oyster form does is amazing. It involves a whole network of people, and we're talking about you know hundreds of millions of dollars that, that depend on, on, on this economy, the oyster economy, in our state. When you have an oyster community, you have people who want to come and fish in those areas. And when they fish in those areas, they buy gas down here, they rent rooms, they visit the restaurants. So they, they help support the community. Our oysters go all over the country. Uh, we couldn't eat them all here in Louisiana. Raw, straight out the water when they're salty, hands down is my favorite dish. On, on any given day, I'm on that water, you're gonna catch me tonging up some oysters. You know, when they're really salty, I don't need supper. I'll come home full. <clears throat> All right, so that was a really good video. I think that was presented by the uh, this like group, this community group down in New Louisiana that you know sponsors the oyster harvesting. But anyhow, <clears throat> as you can see, that's the second video of Louisiana's bountiful amount of you know the alligator stuff that's all in Louisiana too shrimp um I think they do clams down there but their their seafood is one of their main attractions slash money makers but that's how these things work you see how they said they have to build a bed okay and that's um the department of uh fish and game do this too but along these rivers they'll plant these beds of oysters like especially just even half shells that don't have anything alive in it and they'll start to grow off of those. It's almost like they need like a foundation because if the, the riverbed's completely smooth and just dirt, um, the oysters have nothing to hold on to. Like they can't adhere to something to stay in place to filter. They're just gonna keep floating away. So that's why I was saying you have to dump all this rock and stuff down there that's heavy that these oysters can start growing on top of. Um, and that's another thing, they just buy the shells. Like after the people eat these things, a lot of restaurants in Indiana, they just throw shells in the trash, but shells on the coast or places on the coast, they'll actually take these shells, um, grind them up. And if you go down to Florida, Louisiana, these places, you'll see that a lot of the, what we would call gravel and stuff like that around here, um, even beaches, it's just crushed oyster shells. It's just crushed shells because they, they, re, they repurpose them. So um, up here, we don't do a whole lot of that. I don't know why, but I thought it was a really good video on how this process works. Okay, so now the types of oysters. This uh, is a video of mainly American oysters, and she kind of goes over the differences between them, and it's very informative. And even if you don't like oysters, um, there's never a bad time to learn to like oysters because uh, you don't have to eat them raw, but uh, we'll, get over, we'll get it in a minute. In North America, we eat five different species of oysters. However, most of the oysters you see at an oyster bar are variations on two different species. The native Atlantic oyster, or also known as Chrysostrius virginicus, and the Pacific oyster, scientifically known as Chrysostrius gigas. So here I have a couple examples of these two species. You'll notice that the Atlantic oyster, the virginicus, has a signature teardrop shape. This is one. This is another kind. The bottom shell should be smooth and in uniform color, which ranges from brown to white to a light green. This one is a Plymouth Rock Oyster from Duxbury Bay, Massachusetts. Notice it's really nice white shell. 
And here we have a broadwater oyster from the Chesapeake in Virginia. These are both from the same species, but depending on where and how they're grown, they'll be shaped a little bit different. In North America, they're grown up and down the East Coast from as north as New Brunswick, Canada, down to the Gulf of Mexico. Pacific oysters, on the other hand, are naturally more elongated and have jagged, fluted edges. Although they grow faster than Atlantic oysters, you probably won't see the larger meats on the U.S. menus. Most of the larger oysters are actually exported to Asia. They grow in a spectrum of colors, and some genetic strains produce really interesting stripes and patterns on the shells. They're grown as far north as Alaska and as far south as Baja, Mexico. The flavors of the Atlantic and Pacific oysters are really going to depend upon where they come from. So it's actually not that productive to describe generally what they're going to taste like. However, from my experience, I can say that Virginica oysters or Atlantic oysters tend to be more light bodied, clean, and a little bit buttery. Whereas the Pacific oyster is going to be more medium bodied, creamy, sweet, with cucumber and melon notes. So here is the Kumamoto oyster which is its own specific species, also scientifically known as Kerstrostrius sycamea. The Pacific and Kumamoto species are native to Japan and were introduced to the U.S. in the 1920s and 40s, respectively, to supplement the growing demand for oysters. True Kumamoto oysters are small and have a deep cupped shell. They have distinctive ridges on the cupped side that resemble a cat's paw. Kumamotos are characterized by their mild brininess, creamy body, and crisp cucumber finish. They're almost candy-like, which makes them really approachable for beginners. Next we have the Olympia oyster, right here, which is native to the North American West Coast. These little oysters were almost wiped out during the peak of the gold rush. Fortunately, the Olympias, or Ollies, are making a comeback and are now commercially available again, although it's still quite rare to see them on East Coast menus. These oysters are really tiny, but don't be deceived by its small size. The meat packs a punch of smoky, savory, and coppery notes. Finally, we have a species that is native to Europe, scientifically known as Austrius edulis. Also known as the European flat oyster, they're often referred to by the French name Bellon, although true Bellons technically come from a particular area of Brittany in northern France. Only about 5,000 villons are harvested in Maine each year, making them an exceptionally rare oyster. They are large and round, with a relatively shallow cup and a beautifully scallop-shaped shell, tinged with vibrant green from the area's algae. Villons are famous for their bold, unapologetic taste, which some people love and some people hate. Basically, they're not a very good beginner's oyster. The flavor is powerful and the texture is firm and meaty. The most distinctive quality about their taste is their potent, coppery, tannic finish. Most of the oysters we eat today are still named after the place that they're grown. Oysters are a unique food because they embody a sense of a place. Climatic conditions play a huge role in how oysters taste. Everything matters, from the salinity of the water, to the temperature, to the amount of sunlight, and the presence of mountains and minerals. Even the tiniest factors can make an oyster taste distinctive from an oyster that is grown 50 meters away. The French term terroir is often used in wine to describe this idea. However, it's been adapted to talk about oysters, which is known as merar. Throughout this course, I'm going to ask you to keep an oyster journal of your latest and greatest adventures. By actively evaluating and writing down your tasting experiences, you'll be able to develop a better palate for oysters. All you need is a piece of paper. We're not gonna do the whole course, but I just want you guys to see that, uh, that part of it. Um, it gives you a lot of information real quick of you know, just the different styles of oysters, um, the different locations they're brought from. Uh, you got to understand too, a lot of these things will grow, you know, if they, if you have some fishermen that bring oysters, like if they go to Japan, like say during the, one of the wars they brought back, they could even get harvested where like say a boat's parked for a certain amount of time and the, the anchor's down and it pulls up oyster beds and those oysters stay on the anchor and come back. I mean, there, there's just many ways these things happen. Um, there's a lake by my house that has uh, some sort of mussels in it, and they're not native around here, but basically somebody took their boat and anchor to another lake or the ocean somewhere and dropped anchor, <clears throat> picked these things up, brought their boat here, dumped it in this lake, and now they're all over the place. So those things are easily transported as long as there's, uh, there's something available for them to eat and it's got the right conditions. Um, in another video you saw, or I didn't put on here that I was watching, um, one of the main reasons 
there's uh, oysters are harvested typically during the months with uh, the letter R in it. And this is basically because they don't want to harvest these things during warm summer months like June, July, August, because one, that's when they spawn. So you don't want to, you don't want to interrupt anything, any natural spawn period because it's going to slow down the production. And if you do that, you know, you might not have oysters for the next year. So you don't touch them then. And then one of the main reasons is because a lot of these are grown in coastal areas where the water gets really, really warm then. And that's when the most bacteria is in the water. So <clears throat> it's not that you can't eat the oysters, but they might have more bacteria. You're more likely to get sick from an oyster during those hot months, unless it's like further north. Like if you're going all the way up to like Massachusetts or Maine area or way up on the East Coast in Seattle, their water never gets that warm. So those are probably more safe to eat. I think they just do it because of the spawning season. But what I was hearing and reading was you can't really, you don't want to harvest these things. You don't want a Louisiana oyster in the summer months because their water gets really, really warm. And then it has a lot of bacteria growing in it. So you might get sick. So that's one of the reasons. Um, so that's another thing. So, but oh, like she was saying, if these things are grown in a river that's at the bottom of a mountain, that's going to have a lot of fresh water in it, a lot of minerals come through the mountain, through the streams, and they're going to taste completely different from one that's in Louisiana that's not even anywhere near a mountain. It's just having that Louisiana salt water coming through it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's going to have different flavors. Okay. Let me jot down my notes of questions to ask you guys. All right, let's keep going. Um, this next one is how to prepare these. This guy, this guy's kind of funny, but he shows you like five different ways how to cook these. And I thought it was a pretty good video as far as like seeing the different ways. And then I have one more slide after this. Oysters, you either love them or you hate them. If you hate them, this video isn't for you because this video is Oysters 101, all about oysters. I'm in Biloxi, Mississippi, just like coastlines up the Pacific, up the Atlantic, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Florida, all over the coastlines, there are oyster bars, there are oyster taverns, saloons. All right. Let's go ahead and get to He kind of drives around. People do. All right. Four, five, six, seven, eight. This is my ninth oyster. Working on our first dozen here. This is how I shuck them. I normally go in from the joint end, as most people do. Occasionally, if the formation of the shell doesn't allow me any easy access, I will go in through the front using a very thin bladed paring knife to separate the shells. You want to take your oyster knife. That's what this is. is an oyster knife made, designed strictly for what I'm doing here. You want to go in this joint end with your knife. Just give a little twist you'll see where it goes a little bit deeper in there. Once you got it bottomed out, just pop it. All right, it's separated. Now from here, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a tug, pry it open, then run your knife through the top of the shell. And what you're basically doing, if you look right here, is I'm trying to sever this muscle right here. And there it is. There's an oyster all intact. Got the liquor in there. Do not let that liquor pour out. That is pure flavor. If you got any little bits of shell or anything in there you don't care for, just scrape it out. That's looking beautiful. These are beautiful oysters. Come out of Pass Christian, Mississippi, actually on Louisiana waters, which is just due south of Pass Christian. All right, we're gonna char grill this dozen here. I've got a ton of oysters left. This is probably the simplest form of char-grilled oysters, but hey, very, very delicious. I've got other oyster videos on my channel. Bloody Mary oysters. I've got my own rendition of oysters. So you're getting close. We're going to be adding a garlic butter with a little bit of parsley to this. That's really what's going to kick it up a notch. These are going to be excellent.
these oysters are ready. Yeah, I'm going to be right placing there. them over here on some rock salt. That's going to help hold the heat in these very, very hot shells. Ah. I did not want that to happen. Why did it do this? Oysters. I want this thing out of the way. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to go back to where we Oysters. Were. You either love them Yeah, but the oysters begin to curl back, That's plump up, you know they're ready. So this is one of the many ways I enjoy oysters. There's so many things you can do with it. You can fry oysters. I use them on an oyster po' boy. They're fried. A lot of times I mix them with shrimp. My favorite way, which is what we're going to do next, is raw oysters or naked touch of the cocktail sauce. This is more than likely how you're going to see it. I'm going to show you that. It's coming up next. There's many. All right. The flavors, they are perfectly salted. That's the thing about them. This is oysters on the half shell. This is where you shuck them, serve them with cocktail sauce, um, lemons. That's the traditional way. But the next Anytime one. Anytime you prepare this. oysters like I've done today, you never add salt because you've got the perfect salt content from the ocean, from the sea. Now we're going to be doing some fried oysters. Going to make some real simple, easy to make little oyster po boys. Going to start by taking one egg. Gonna take some beer. We're gonna add this beer into that one egg. Now you guys can't use beer, but they have a, you could put Sprite, something like that. But this is just the video. This is a traditional way. That's why they have this on here. We're gonna beat this in. I've taken and drained these oysters, all the juices out of them. We're just gonna let them hang out right here in this beer and egg. While that's doing that, I'm going to take self-rising flour and I'm going to season it pretty liberally. Just use your favorite seasoning. Go in with a little bit more. And yeah, as really. I stated earlier, you never salt your oysters. This particular rub is not very high in salt or sodium. So we should be looking good. When you do decide to use a seasoning for your oysters, look for a low salt, low sodium. All right, I'm gonna use the same strainer that I used earlier to strain the liquor from the oysters. And now I'm gonna strain the egg and the beer. These are nice and coated. From here, we're just simply gonna dump these oysters over into this flour mixture. You'll have to use your hands for this one. A little bit of egg there is not going to hurt nothing. What you want to do is completely embed this flour and toss them into these oysters, making sure to coat all sides. And for this to really adhere and hold good, once you get these fully coated, just bury them up under the flour and let them hang out for around at least a minute. All right, we just want to let them sit right here. We're letting our oil. All right, so what he's doing there, he's saying let them sit in there because you don't want, when you're battering something like that, or uh, breading something, I'm sorry, um, you don't want anything wet coming out of it. You want it to absorb all the flour so it's completely coated because when you throw something like a very soggy oyster into fryers, um, it could boil over. Like it could be kind of detrimental. Um, I used to work at a seafood place on the water where you could actually pull your boat up to it and dock. And it wasn't, it wasn't fancy, it was just like a shack, but we would fry thousands of oysters daily. It was right, right where they fish for these things. And if you did not get these things completely coated with flour and you put them right in that fryer, it's going to start crackling and popping and blowing up on you, which some of you experienced at school this past uh, couple months when, when we cook things. All come up to temperature, we'll be deep frying shortly. Got my temperature up to 350 degrees on this cooking oil. You can use a canola, vegetable oil, any oil of your choice, really. Canola, I particularly like because there's not a lot of flavor in that oil that takes away from the flavor of the seafood. We're just going to drop these in. We're going to fry them till they're golden brown. It's not going to take long. All you're looking for is a real golden brown, and we're just about there. The last thing you want to do is overcook these oysters. All right, 
I'm going to start taking these out. A real restaurant quality. If you go into the seafood restaurant, some po' boy buns, and we're going to put us a po' boy together. So I'm making like little po' boys. These are not that big. These are only like five inches long, inch and a half wide. So I'm going with two of them. One would just make me mad. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and spread just plain straight up mayo on both sides, top and bottom. All right, next I have some shredded lettuce. I'll put a little there on each bottom. Video up also where I did a, a oyster BLT using the homemade bacon I did. Oh my goodness. You need to try that. There you go. And I'm just going to put a dash or two. I was going to say, you got to have hot sauce. hot sauce. See if we can close these up. There you go. Oh yeah. That's what I'm talking about. We're ready for a taste. All right, those are probably one of my favorite sandwiches of all time, too. Um, you can do lobster po' boy, oyster po' boy, shrimp po' boy. I think shrimp and oyster are probably my favorite. I like lobster rolls myself, but easy way, like, to sh and you can buy these oysters like he had them. Like, you can buy them in a can, actually. You can buy them shucked already. Um, and then that kind of goes... Oysters. Yeah. Okay, so the last part... I just want to show you guys some different styles. Like you saw the fried, you saw raw on the half shell, which is the traditional way people eat these things. Um, and you saw that guy in that video where he's like, if I go out on the boat, I come back, I don't even need dinner because I eat so many oysters out on the water. Um, you just eat them raw like that. And they're, it's just a, a very unique, delicious flavor. But um, here's another way you could broil these, season them, turn your broiler on in your oven, pop them up top, and um, it just, they firm up enough. So if it's a texture thing with you, just, just roast them. Uh, put them on the grill like he did in here. This one is called uh, the Rockefeller style, where you take, I've seen this 10 different ways, but basically it's like bacon, spinach. Um, you could put cream in it. Um, not a lot of salt, but pepper. And you cook it, like you make like a filling and you put it on top and you braise them uh, or to broil them. And you can put hollandaise sauce on it, whatever you want. This is a Benedict. Remember we talked about Benedicts during breakfast? Um, this is an uh, oyster Benedict. So it's a bread. It looks like they have a green on here, um, poached egg, and then fried oysters. There's the fried oysters, and there's a poached egg up top, and then the hollandaise sauce on top. That's probably like the richest Benedict I've ever seen. And then this last thing, which some of you guys might have had, this is oyster dressing. So that's why, that's the main reason I wanted to do oysters today because Thanksgiving's coming up and uh, dressing's like a traditional, you know, a traditional item. And if you guys don't understand what dressing is originally from, it's not because it never came in like a bag where you add seasoned stuff to it. Typically many years ago and then, oh, pretty much every other country, um, <clears throat> you, bread is just a daily thing like you don't buy these giant bags of bread that we have at our grocery stores like i lived in italy for a little bit and there was a bakery across the street you go get your bread every day um, every morning you just go over there the baker has probably been up since 11 o'clock the night before baking bread all day or all night and typically every household would have leftover bread like stale bread that's where you get your french toast that's where you get your oyster dressing that's where you get croutons just stuff like there's italians have a ton of different things like panzania and stuff like that and pan is just bread um where they take leftover day old bread and make something with it bread crumbs that's why you have things that are breaded because you have old bread um and that's what this is that's where the dressing comes from is somebody didn't bake bread just for dressing they bake this is the old bread they chopped up add some oysters to it, maybe a little chicken broth, sauteed mirepoix, whatever vegetables you have, and then you bake it. And then it, it ends up absolutely delicious. And that's probably one of my favorite things in the world, but I can't eat it. So, all right. So there's our uh, oysters talk. Um, I think, I hope you guys liked it, but 
show your parents the oyster dressing. I guarantee someone in your family has had oyster dressing and they're like, oh, we got to make that this year. Guaranteed. Hands down. All right, guys, have a good Thanksgiving and I will see you uh, a couple weeks.